here we go. Final version. Securing yourself online. We are at risk. All of us are at risk. Excellent I'm not attention, about Gary. STDs, global warming, or terrorism. I'm talking about your life online. You are at risk of having your computer taken over so that perfect strangers can read your email, access your bank accounts, pilfer your credit card numbers, and even steal your identity. I've seen this over and over again at my summer job as a computer technician at a nationwide computer store. You wouldn't believe how many computers are compromised and infected. As college students, we're particularly vulnerable because we spend so much time online. According to David Tatter, manager of Wisconsin's Consumer Office of Privacy Protection, 32% of all identity theft claims are filed by people between the ages of 18 and 29 years old. That's the largest percentage of any age group. Today I'd like to explain three additional steps that experts recommend for online security. Using strong passwords, using secure connections, and double checking links before clicking on them. Step one. The first step is using strong passwords for email accounts, bank accounts, and everything else that you do online. What makes a strong password? Take a look at this example. I W B I P semicolon semicolon four three eight seven hyphen C S A M F F. Now this is a long password, but that's part of its strength. The first criterion of a strong password is having ten characters. Fifteen or more is even better, like the one I showed you. It should also include upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and punctuation such as semicolons, hyphens, and underscores. According to Microsoft's online guide to creating strong passwords, when your passwords contain long combinations of seemingly random letters, numbers, and punctuation, your security increases exponentially, meaning that a password like the one I showed you is literally billions of times more secure than something short and ordinary, like hot dog or a college. In addition to having a strong password, you should use a secure connection whenever possible. How do you know if a connection is secure or insecure? Here's an insecure connection. If you look at the address bar, you'll see the first letters are HTTP, highlighted here with the red arrow. Whenever you see HTTP in a website address, your connection is not secure. It's fine to read websites with this kind of connection, but you should never transmit sensitive information over HTTP. When the connection is secure, it will begin with HTTPS, as in this example. And think of the S as standing for safe or secure. So far, we've seen the importance of having a strong password and of using secure connections whenever transmitting sensitive data. The third step is double checking links before you click them. This is a little more involved than the previous steps but it's just as important. For example, here's an email that was supposedly sent from my bank, Franklin Bank. It tells me that I need to click on the blue link in order to update my account information. But if we take a closer look, we can see that while the link says bankfranklin.com, the actual destination is another site entirely. If I hold my cursor over the link for a second or two without clicking on it, the yellow box that pops up will show the real website, not Franklin Bank but something called ssedu.org.cn forward slash dedde. This looks like it might be my bank's information, but it's not. It's a fraudulent website run by a hacker who's trying to gain access to my financial information. By double checking potentially questionable links before you click on them, you can avoid scams like this one. What do you do if the email link doesn't match the one your cursor reveals? The answer is, don't click. It's as simple as that. At the beginning of this speech, I said that you're at risk. And that's true, but you're not helpless. I've shared three proven ways to protect yourself. Strong passwords, secure connections, and 
double checking links. I hope you'll find this information helpful as you fight this endless battle for online security. Okay, and we're going to also view the uh, Hidden World of Chili Peppers, the final version. Again, this is an informative speech. Imagine your mouth burning like wildfire, your eyes squirting out uncontrollable tears, and your face red and sweating profusely. Are you sick? No, you just took a bite of a screaming hot chili pepper. Congratulations, you're partaking in a worldwide tradition that has been spicing up lives and diets for thousands of years. My own desire for spicy meals led me to investigate why I get red in the face and salivate over the mere thought of eating a spicy chili. In the process, I've discovered there's a lot more to chili peppers than I'd ever imagined. Today, I'd like to share with you what I've learned about the history of chili peppers, why they can be so spicy, what to do if you eat a too hot pepper, and some of the ways chili peppers are used other than in foods. The chili pepper has a long and fascinating history. Its scientific name is capsicum. Now this is different than the common black pepper you have on your dining room table, whose scientific name is Piper Nigra. Black pepper was first cultivated in Asia and was prized in the West as early as the Roman Empire. In contrast, the chili pepper originated more than 5,000 years ago in South America, near what is today Bolivia and Brazil. Over time, it spread to Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. But it wasn't until Columbus came in the 1490s that the chili pepper became known to the rest of the world. As stated in the Cambridge World History of Food, within 50 years after Columbus returned to Spain with sample plants, chili peppers could be found growing in coastal areas from Africa to Asia. From there, they spread inland until they had taken hold of the taste buds of people around the globe. Today, they're most widely used in Mexico, Central and South America, Africa, Asia, the Balkans, and the United States. Carolyn Dilly and Susan Belsinger, authors of the Chili Pepper book, estimate that 25% of the world's adult population uses chili peppers as a part of their daily diet. Now that we know a little bit about the history of chili peppers, let's see why they can put such a fire in our bellies. The pleasure and pain involved in eating chili pepper comes from a chemical called capsaicin. Capsaicin is concentrated in the pepper's veins and seeds, pictured here. To enjoy the flavor of chili pepper without burning your stomach or mouth, avoid the veins and seeds when cooking or eating them. P.W. Bosman tells us in the book, Spices, Herbs, and Edible Fungi, that chili pepper intensity is measured in two ways. The first was developed by Wilbur L. Scoville in 1912. This method uses trained testers to measure chili peppers in Scoville heat units. These range from zero to 300,000. According to Bosman, this test is subjective because it relies on the individual tester's sensitivity to capsaicin. The second more widely used test is called the High Performance Liquid Chromatography Test, more commonly known as HPLC. This is also measured in Scoville heat units, but it's more objective. The chili pods are dried and ground, and then the chemicals responsible for the heat are analyzed and rated according to pungency. The hottest pepper on record is the deceptively small and unimposing orange habanero pepper. It's been rated as high as 300,000 Scoville heat units, and it's so powerful that some people have an allergic reaction just by touching it, which is why I'm holding it by the stem. The mildest pepper is the standard green bell, which you see at the grocery store every day. It's been rated at zero Scoville heat units. orange habanero pepper, it's important to know how to deal with the burning sensation. Whatever you do, do not rinse your mouth with water. Dave DeWitt, in the Chili Pepper Encyclopedia, tells us capsaicin is not soluble in water, and even if you drink a gallon of ice water, it's not going to help. According to the Chili Pepper Institute at New Mexico State University, the best solution is to consume a dairy product. 
products, such as milk or yogurt, which contain a substance that strips away capsaicin from the interior cells of your mouth. This is why some hot foods, like Indian foods, are served with yogurt sauce. Now, if you burn your skin, the Institute recommends cleaning the area with rubbing alcohol and then soaking it with milk. Above all, remember two things. First, always wear gloves when you cut a hot pepper, such as a habanero. Second, never rub your eyes when working with hot chili peppers. Although chili peppers are prized above all for the flavor they add to food, they have other benefits as well. Pepper sprays have become a standard weapon for the personal protection of individuals and law enforcement agencies. The New York Times reports sales of pepper sprays have risen steadily and show no sign of swelling. Chili peppers are also valued for their medicinal properties. According to Jack Chalm, author of The Nutrition Reporter, there have been more than 1,300 medical studies on capsaicin, the active ingredient in chili peppers. Moderate doses have been proven to aid digestion, reduce hypertension, improve circulation, and help dissolve blood clots. Preliminary research by Professor Kenji Okajima at Japan's Kumamoto University School of Medicine suggests that a combination of chili peppers and soybeans can promote hair growth and might hold promise as a cure for baldness. In closing, it's difficult to imagine our lives without the spice added by chili peppers. From their origin in South America to their current popularity around the world, peppers have been used not only to flavor our food, but also to improve our health and personal safety. While it remains to be seen whether or not chili peppers can actually cure baldness, we can be sure this ancient plant will continue to find new uses in our modern age. Thank <laughs> you.